Well, I always wanted to say this since I'm in Houston. Houston, we have a climate narrative problem. Today's Tom Nelson podcast is a Willie Soon presentation recorded on November 6, 2023. The title is Bad Data. Are NASA, NOAA, EPA, and IPCC violating the Data Quality Act and ignoring science to push preferred climate and energy policies? The climate narrative is that CO2 is causing global warming, right? And then, by the way, global warming has transitioned into climate change, global weirding, climate whiplash. The latest one, as you know, is uh, Antonio uh, Gutierrez, the UN uh, chief. It's saying that it's global boying, so be aware. We are listening to all kinds of this scaremongering, and it, unfortunately, the problem is still the problem. What is the data? What is the quality of the data that they use to make claims like this? And then here, clearly, that today I want to address the problem of NASA, NOAA, EPA, and, and IPCC. They are more or less made of the same mold. And then I'll explain the history a bit, of course, so that you are a little bit familiar with this subject. I do want to say that, please, I have a lot of junk in here. I know that it's going to bring you a headache. But my purpose, like I say, to come to a really soon talk is that you must learn some science. And then I would make all the slides available. I would encourage you to even speak on this subject because it's easy enough. So then I said it once that you can go and do it yourself. Share the slide and talk to people when people say, See, on to causing global warming. You say, have you looked at this graph before? Have you looked at this data? That's a key story to try to convince people, not by arguing emotional, you know, Elgo is number one, by the way, where's my phone? Elgo might call me, so you guys be careful. I'm going to put it right here. All right. Before I start, I want to acknowledge, of course, my, my two collaborators, Dr. Michael and uh, Ronan Connolly from Ireland. They are among my best collaborators that I've ever been able to work with. The first thing is to explain how EPA, NOAA, and uh, NASA got tied into this whole thing. You know that in United Nations, uh, United States, we have this thing called the U.S. Global Change Research Program. It's a bit of an oxymoron, right? U.S. Global, right? Uh, it's basically a product of United Nations, as you can imagine. This is actually a mandate, right, by Congress. And if you look a bit of the history, they were formed in 1989 and then formally in 1990. It's a 14 agency by now. It has always has been 13 agencies since the founding in 1990. And February 2023 of this year, Homeland Security apparently is uh, not enough work. They actually joined this uh, particular program, so they are now 14 agencies. So Mayoka might have something more to do on this business. And here's, here's the problem, right? This is a legal mandate. And they're trying to say that well, we're supposed to study these issues on uh, you know, potential human causing global warming and things like that. So we have to be prepared for this thing. And then the, the stuff that I want to tie in, since you guys are in a law school, I'm not a lawyer, of course. I, I used to play one on TV, of course. But uh, for, for this uh, Data Quality Act, it is a very, very known stuff. The, the guy that knows the most is actually sitting right here, Randy Randall, right? He used to work for Exxon Mobil, so we know a lot about story like this. But I can show you two examples in the fourth assessment that NCA is National Climate Assessment. The fourth assessment in 2018, they actually talk about the compliance with the Quality Act, which means they are worried about this. This is a real law. And we have to take advantage of this and try to do this. And we'll discuss later if you want to know more. But I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but I'm trying to say that these laws appear to be relevant. And then the fifth report that is coming out anytime soon, okay? also have this information quality uh, uh, declaration to try to say that you're looking at a solid product, a solid product, you can trust it, 100%. Now, we want to show that how rotten this whole thing is, right? It's not even close, I'm sorry. So that's the problem. One thing that caught attention, by the way, this is a, an act that data quality appeared in one of these budget thing in the 106th Congress in 2001. It's hidden under this pile of uh, money spending. But one thing that caught my attention is this. Not only that they have to make sure the quality of the data for all the rules and regulations are, that you're trying to make is good, that you have to have a mechanism that allowing a affected person to seek and obtain correction of the information maintained and disseminated by the agency that does not comply with the guideline. I really think that this is the, the hole in which that we can make some statement. And oh, this thing jumped by itself, fine. So 
I'm going to start now by explaining what IPCC is about because IPCC, as you know, established in 1988. 89, you can see US follow, right? And it has published uh, six reports so far from 1990 to 2021. The, the latest one was uh, 2021. And then their most iconic statement is indeed the observed global warming since 1950. It's a deep human cause, okay? But is this conclusion reasonable, right? We're going to look at the data, of course. And the data are generated by NOAA, by the way. So you can see NOAA, this is IPCC from IPCC report. It took four of this curve. Yeah, yeah. Berkeley, Earth is actually, you see Berkeley, there's a group that produces the data. Which uh, heavy crew is basically, so it's a temperature record, right? From 1850 to now. And the curve looked like, you know, looked like a reasonable scientific curve. What could be wrong with this curve like this, okay? So this is the part that IPCC called detection because it's about the data. Can you detect the global warming, right? Then we'll talk about attribution and that's part of it. Sorry that the language has to be there because that's the nomenclature they're using. So I have to use that. So they are showing that kind of curve. So how do they attribute? How do they assign cause? So you observe a change. You want to find out what is causing it. Can it be the ants or can it be Al Gore breathing too hard? And can it be, you know, car park in the parking lot, that kind of stuff. So they actually produce, this is the iconic graph, by the way. One, two, three, by the fourth assessment, 2007, fifth assessment, 2013, and then it's more or less the same copy because this is the only starting point. So let's look closer. You look closer as a, in this graph, right? They basically have a bunch of uh, blue stuff, which is actually climate model produced, climate model. And then the actual data is that black curve going up and down. And then the, the deep blue is average of all the climate model results. So on the left here, you can see, this is a part that when you try to calculate using the climate model, you use only natural forcing, like the sun and volcano. So you don't talk about CO2. And then when they add CO2, natural and natural forcing, you can see it fit. You know, Al Gore said, fit, right? His son, his friend, uh, Baba, discovered the continental drift theory, right? And, you know, the fit, the coast of South America and Africa kind of fit. So that solved the whole problem. Huh. But the only problem is that it's not even close. That's what I'm trying to warn you, okay? That's a lot of technical detail, but we won't get into that too much. So that's basically what they're saying. They, given that they know how the... This is a very hard problem, by the way, to know what the sun is doing and the volcano, obviously. That they cannot explain. So therefore, they solve the whole problem. This is actually the evidence. Fair enough, right? Fair enough, right? Are you all convinced? If you're convinced, you should go home now. Actually, there's nothing to talk about, but I will show you the tricks. No wonder. IPCC, for those who don't know, I don't like to invoke names. You know, science is about evidence. But this is one of the smart guys. His name is John Clauser, Dr. John Clauser, who actually did a lot of quantum mechanics work that win the Nobel Prize in 2022. Look at what he said. I didn't say this, okay? IBCC is one of the worst sources of dangerous misinformation. So please beware. You already know a guy of that caliber saying something like this, then tells you something is seriously bad, okay? But how does a UN IBCC report and result have to do with the US global change research, right? And how does the EPA, NOAA, and NASA, you know, forward to this picture? I told you that NOAA is the main source of the data, temperature data generated, okay? And NASA is actually the main source of the data for the total solar irradiance because you need to build satellite to go up in space <coughs> to measure the, how the sun changes, okay? That's the role. I want to highlight this fact that unfortunately, I think most people have never even heard of it. The only person possibly is actually Randy. This is one of the reports, the third report published by the US Global Change Research in 2009. And then I want to stare, let, let you look at this curve. Remember they're showing the same thing that you saw in the beginning from the IPCC report? You, you won't see anything wrong with this graph, by the way. You know, it's the same. The blue one is the natural forcing with the climate model, and, and, then, and then the black one is the observation, and then the human adding human, the human effects adding in, then it fits better, right? That's basically what it is. You didn't know this is a problem. Somebody in, I, in EPA, and you can include all the 13 agencies, by the way, no one checks. I show you first where the ground come from. The ground come from the form assessment from one of these plots. You all agree, right? But notice that that one, they turn into absolute Fahrenheit. This one is actually temperature anomalies. You have to learn how to read graph, my friend. This is what they are doing to you. They are hoodwinking everybody. I'm telling you, this story has never been told, really. I even maybe spoke about it once, once. 
Okay, I work on this problem 33 years. Once in 33 years, this is the second time. So look at this. Somebody actually did this. This is a huge mistake. If you think this is, ah, no, it's okay, just somebody, you know, secretary was making error. I'm sure all the big guns will say, oh, it's the secretary doing that. <laughs> they actually make a big problem. <laughs> and this, this error has persisted from 2009 to 2013, actually 2015. I want to show you my last check. So you can see now, right, the problem is basically going from here to here, but what is wrong? The wrong part is uh, going to come up very soon, but I want to show you that I check everything. Until 2015, this graph is still there, which means error gone undetected by 13 U.S. agency for six, seven years until somebody realized, let's take it down, let's take it down. Re re remove the evidence. You can't do that. And then don't tell nobody about this. This thing ought to be told more, actually. Be, and then now I'll explain to you what the problem is. That's the difference between temperature anomalies and absolute temperature. In the actual climate model simulation, which is all this line, the observation is this square diamond, dark square diamond. In actual climate models, all the climate models have to be fixed, adjust. You understand? It's very difficult to create a climate model on the Earth and calculate the global temperature. Okay? The values are all over the place. This is the absolute value. And you will see, that's the range of the temperature. And then I show you that a published paper. And it took a long time. Even that first graph was not published. This is actually official publication by a German group, climate model group. That show you the same result. There are like 30 some models here. And then these are observations. And these are also observations. Even observation and observation don't agree in the absolute level. Do you all see now what the problem is? They transform the difference because when you do anomaly, you take a mean so you don't care what the absolute level is, you transform. But you know, climate models should care because you know why? I freezes at zero degree, water really boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It's no joke, man. How you think they're gonna represent ice sheets or sea ice or anything, ice on a mountain? This is a very basic problem. And guess what? They just ignored it. And I'm trying to tell you, I asked the question, where is the peer review here? Where is the data quality act or the information quality act right here? None, actually. That's what it is. A total of this agency. <laughs> That's my conclusion on this point. <laughs> you all know what it means. They have split pens. And then they didn't realize it, apparently. So let me go and talk a little bit more about the details of data now, OK? I want to talk about the land temperature for the measurement of global temperature record, right? I want to assert that I will show you that it's contaminated by what we call urban urbanization bias, which is urban hint island effect. There's no better place than like, oh, Houston to prove this point. I'll show some data. And then another problem is for the attribution, the cause. What is causing the temperature to change that can explain the, the curve, okay? Actually, I would say that since I've been studying the sun irradiance for a really long time, actually, ever since I was born, essentially. I started, it's a really hard problem. And I'm a very slow learner. It took a long time to understand this thing. Really, this talk could not be given last year or this year until we published the paper this year, right? We published a paper in August, one is October, so it just came out. And I will show you even more paper that we published together that, that actually represent the, the, the full story. So the estimate of the solar irradiance, how the sunlight changes over time, is also wrong, okay? And this is a set of uh, paper, okay? Again, anyone who wants to read them, please. Especially, I think people that should read this, Elbo, Gavin Schmain, and one of those NASA directors, all these big directors, they should read this, and then come and talk to me, right? I'm free, okay? No problem. Anyway, this is one other example. I want to show you that, you know, uh, jo Josiah mentioned that I published 120 paper. It, it's, it's actually not the number that's important. It's the quality. This is one of the papers that we published in 2021. In scientific paper, if you have five people or even 100 people reading your paper, this one has 55,000. They are very worried. That's why they're coming after me all the time. They say I'm corrupted, taking money, I don't know, storing money everywhere. But as to show you the quality of this work, we publish this a lot, and then you can see it. It has 20 co under 14 countries and 530 references. I'm going to do this for you to compare quality of our work versus IPCC, okay? Here's one of the summary. Look at this. All right, IPCC report, they, they, for studying solar activity, they cited 68 papers. For the urbanization bias, they cited 26, 28, so total of 96. And look at how many papers we cite on the solar. 396, six times more than them, okay? 
And then we really are much more careful. IPCC, here's a simple story. IPCC is cherry picking. We are actually studying science for everything. Because science is not a hit and run like a punch him and then I run away. No, no. <coughs> Who's doing that? That's crazy. You don't do that. It's wrong. Okay? You can never do that. And they always want to do things like this. And then they want to push the agenda, the policy agenda, which is very dangerous. Okay. For the IPCC detection process, this is the part about menstrual temperature. I want to show you the kind of problem. Sorry, I torture you through this, okay? I'm going to torture you a little bit. First problem is urban heat island. It's well known. Here, example, I show Paris and uh, Singapore. Okay, I'm going to show you the name. It just show you that this phenomenon is known by Luke Howard in about 1812 or something. In London, they already realized in the inner part, in the part of the city, it tends to be a lot warmer. Where you change the surface, used to be grassland with a lot of previous surface, you know, water can go in and out. I mean, these are, you put concrete or you even put a strong dirt cover over it, you change the insulation property of the ground, right? So things like that. It's clearly that this phenomenon is real. It's not in every city. And then, Urban Heat Island in Houston is very, very large. The amplitude, I just want to talk to you, number is very important. We're not talking about, people say that global warming can cause the globe to warm by, I don't know, five degrees Fahrenheit, things like that. We are talking about global warming right in Houston, right here, from here to that, right? Sorry. 10 degrees even, okay? They have some even smaller scale measurement that they done in 2021 for the whole, uh, uh, what you call Houston, that shows that. So it's known for a long time. Urban area indeed, it's, it has only like three to 4% of the land area, 2% of the whole planet. But the problem is this, all the thermometer data we have, 75% of them are all in that kind of area that is urbanized. This is the fundamental problem, okay? We are information limited. I'll show you how much more problem we have. And then after 2011, you can see, right? Then so most of the people live in the, in the, in the <laughs> urban city now. Here's one simple summary of the graph. The, we, we analyze the data for US. You, if you study the top 20% most urban station, you will see that it's warming with some particular numbers. I think here we have 1.1, one degrees per century. If you study the 20% most rural station, you see it's 0.6. That's a factor of 1.8, actually 80%, okay, more in the urban area versus the rural one. And that number makes a huge difference. And you can see already the slowly hint, the character is so different. And then when you look over the Northern Hemisphere, you will see that things are very, very different. Here's uh, the projection of uh, urban heat island. By 2100, te Texas will be number one, of course. You're gonna beat uh, New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago in terms of population. <laughs> right? Dallas is predicted to be the biggest city, and then uh, Houston, number two, and then Austin. So this is gonna be continuing problem that is not gonna go away. You cannot hide. You have to start discussing this. What does it mean to measure temperature here, right? I know we human, we, this is still a bit of a climate, but, but it's not a climate having to do with the natural climate and weather, really. And here's an example of our, of our data. data. People keep using the word global, this global that, right? I'm very irritated by that because no one wants to look at the graph. Look at the 1880. There's no data anywhere. How are you going to talk about global? It's mostly, I mean, there's nothing. It's just only in North America, Europe, and East Asia. By now, of course, now we have a lot more data. That's more interesting, okay? But I want to show you the tricks that how we go and do the rural only station to compare with the one that has the urban station. And that shows a very complete different picture. Wow, that's why sometimes cartoon helps, right? I mean, they essentially have no data, basically. You want to measure the whole ocean? How are you going to do that? Put the water everywhere, right? And then here is how about no data, right? This is saying that, oh, you want to measure 1% of the ocean temperature and estimate 99%. And then the smart guy say, how about nothing? Just estimate everything. That, that's a good idea according to them, but it's bad. They, they, here now, I have to be concrete. Sorry that I torture you through this. Now I want to talk about the problem in thermometer data. By the way, how I wish I can show you a data from US like this. Do you know why? After working for 33 years, they won't even give us any of these things. You don't know how many times I request from NOAA people. So you can see the problem. So I give you an example from uh, Valencia Island. By the way, this one is a famous place. In 1867 to 1892, it's located there as a thermometer station. Then they move into the inland spot there. And then by, by about 2001, they move in here. Okay. This is the history. You need to know where the thermometer are being placed before you show the record. And then I will show you what, what we did here. 
So what we think is that the temperature record look like this. These are the times in which they shift the station. Okay, and then this is how then we can adjust. If we know what they shift and how much they, they change, then we know exactly what happened. Okay, now I want to come to the problem. The problem of what NOAA is recommending. Roma is recommending, please, no need to look at all this data. We just use computers. They call it uh, homogenization on temperature series via pairwise comparison. This is the kind of googly doop that they, they thought is going to scare a lot of people away. You know? Some people like Willie Soon, right? With Sunny, we just study. Even though I don't know the subject, I'm not a climatologist. I'm just a basic good old every scientist who really wants data. So I studied this thing. We studied this very carefully, by the way. And then I'll show you now what happened. Okay, you saw this, right? This is what we did. Found the temporal data, record meta history, and look at what, what happened in the in the NOAA computer program. Okay, you might have confused my expert. This is the version of data of October 2011, January 2012, January 2013, 2014, 2015. You notice that where the place jumped, the, the data are changing. They keep adjusting the data daily, actually. Every time they have an update of data, the computer tells them to do different things. This is not for one station, we will show you for a lot of them. And this is a problem. They say, don't look at the history of the state of data. Just, just use computer, and this is what the computer is giving you. Do you know that problem like this? I know you don't want to look at this, but now you should not trust the temperature record that they give you, especially the one that's being massaged, called the homogenization data. So in 2022, my great colleague, he's actually a retired guy who don't care about anything. He only won one station. His name is Professor Peter O'Neill. You know what he did? Every time Noah update, so since about 2010 until now, now, now he's doing it with collecting the data daily. We have over 2,000 to 3,000 version of what this Noah produced data because all the data coming to NOAA. NOAA is the only place we have resources and then they give the rest of the world. All the World Meteorological Organization take all the data from all the countries in the world, they send it to NOAA. Uh, NOAA. NOAA process this and then giving back to them. And even NASA doesn't do the work. NASA just contract and take the work from the NOAA himself. So you can see already there's no independence, there's no science, nothing. And in this work, guess what? People in the US don't want to work with us. But all the European meteorological agency, bunch of these people from Croatia, from Germany, from Austria, from Poland, from Czech Republic, they work with us. We only ask them, can you give us the metadata, the history one? They gave us. So we have that. And you know what we did? Here's a summary plot. So with about two, three thousand version, we can check how consistent NOAA adjustment and in class. Because we know the actual history of the thing, right? We show that there's only 17 percent of the whole adjustment apply consistently. So, which means 80, 87 or 3 percent of them is useless, basically. And then, if you check against the actual changes versus what the computer adjusted, less than 20 percent are following exactly what they observed. Uh, meta history. This is very devastating for them. By the way, I didn't advertise any of this thing, but they want to worry about work like this because it shows that the data is completely junk. You don't use it. I mean, I think that this is something significant of a challenge. Oh, by the way, I'm not assuming I'm God or anything. If we're wrong, I mean, show me. Come on. Come on down. Discuss. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I'll go. You will call. Okay, I'll go. I'm not calling. Anyway, so our idea now is that get rid of, don't use any of the urban stations. Just look over the rural station. These are all the stations that we can find that we are confident with because we can at least see what the meta history. So we have a lot of control in Ireland because my two colleagues went everywhere. They, they don't get directly from them, but they go to the observatory and get all those data. So China, we have access. We talk to some people in Arctic and then USA, obviously. We have some data. So we use the rest of the 10 to 15% of available temperature record because large part of it is all urbanized already. But this covers 90% of the rural stations that are available in the whole world, which means this is a very comprehensive result. So we published this in 2015 already, by the way. So I show you now the example. We smooth now. We, instead of year-to-year -year changes, we smooth them over decades so we can show. The top one is the urban versus rural, and then the bottom one is rural only. You can see it's a very big difference because if you calculate the warming trend here, it's actually about one degree. And then the other one is only 0.6 right here. That show you is already 40% right there, the difference. 
Not only that, the more, even more important is not about that. If you want to find the causal changes, this one tells you that there's something, just keep going. This one is saying that there's cooling, the warming, the cooling, the warming. Okay? That's a very different character, and we will show you always see the sun fit better than for that one. So, you can check. So now, the question is, that how good is our rural data, right? We've got to answer it like this. We're going to look at other available data, like sea surface temperature, how good it is, on temperature proxy. Temperature proxy just means that indirect measurements of the temperature, right? You basically study tree ring waves, lake sediment, you know, ocean sediment, that kind of stuff, but also ice core stuff, okay? So you try to do that. But still, ultimately, I want to mention that the top gold standard of temperature measurement ought to be the thermometer data, right, isn't it? Because it has direct, it's fixed spot, it doesn't change with time, and it has very long record, okay? So now we want to show you. See here, yeah? we got the rural record, and then if you compare with sea surface temperature, you've got three rings, you've got the glacial land, and then even all this modern stuff that don't have all the data, you can see that qualitatively, most of them are indicating that our rural station records are reasonable, okay? So let me run a little bit faster now. Let's see. Now let's go to the attribution cause. What is causing the climate to change? Now I think I want to focus on mostly the, what you call the rural station. How can we explain by the sun or something, right? And I want to show you now, IPCC is so concerned. For the, for the main factor, they consider 11 of them, 11 smoking guns, basically what they say. They even consider something called a black carbon on snow. They're so sad that they even talk about cocktail, you know, like chemtrail, things like that. They're talking about that. They even talk about shallow street water, which is nothing. Even that they consider. I show you this graph because I want to show you how much they put the sun to be, okay? So have a look in a minute. So now for solar, when they, for the natural forcing, what do they use? They use volcano. By the way, I'm very sad about volcanologists. They don't speak up. They turn the whole problem of volcano into cartoon. No two volcanoes are the same. The volcano, they don't, they created something called the radiative forcing, okay? And this is actually, I wouldn't accept even this, okay? But we will just play along with the numbers, okay? But for the sun, look at this. What is this? You barely see the line. By the way, all the plots are plotted on the same scale. Plus three watts and minus three watts, okay? You can barely even see the sun. By the way, this is all together. If you compare this, this and this, right? In terms of forcing and then the climate has a warmer cool, is there a chance for the sun to be correct? Can you answer? Zero chance. And I will show you what's the problem with their representation. These people are so bad that I have to say, I have to take time. Make sure you, you say that you agree with this or not. You take a look, you think about it. And then normally, if you don't check, you will just say, oh yeah, IPCC must be correct because the sun cannot possibly do anything. But let's figure out how much the sun gives us. The whole weather and climate system is powered by solar energy, there's nothing else. Think about the numbers. Sorry, I have to mention numbers. Power, 4 times 10 to 26 watts. The Earth itself can only have 2 times 10 to 17, so it's about 2 billion times weaker. Even that, this is actually converted solar energy. The real radiogenic heat, which is the main, a tiny amount of heat, is a factor of 10,000 smaller. By the way, these are real scientific numbers. These are all physics experiments that we have done can measure that. You can imagine, you can even pulse a laser at that kind of thing. China is leading the pulse laser business, but it's very short pulse. So just to give you a sense of what that number means, you know, boom, like this must be five watts per meter square, right? Anyway, so could they have underestimated the role of the sun? That's the question. By the way, it's not possible for them to overestimate. Please, when it's zero, there's no way you can overestimate anything, right? So look at this. Can they ask an underestimate? I want to tell you that the sun is indeed a very dynamic source of energy. It emits in all wavelengths. This is one of the famous phenomena, right? It's called the solar flare or corona mass ejection. And then let me move to the next one. And then you have features like what we call sunspot, right? You have sunspot, and these are sunspot is actually intense magnetic field region on the on the surface of the sun, right? The Earth is also a magnet, by the way, but our magnet is only like one gauss in unit. This guy is 10,000 gauss right here, concentrated. That's why it's dark, okay? And from studying this phenomenon, sun's activity, sun's born, and actually more important is all the other background changes, okay? We can try to see that actually how that affects the light output to the sun, to the, to the earth, okay? And then we know that the first data was actually collected by Galileo Galilei, right? 1609 or so, he pointed his telescope, and this is the history from 17th century until now. 
And then there's a period that I actually waste, spend my 52 weekend before I get married, I wrote a book on this, on the minimum, to explain why that all of a sudden the sun disappeared. And then that is the part that we can actually say that the light output is actually much, much reduced. This is why you can imagine you have a little ice age, right? People skating on the Thames and, and the Dutch, uh, uh, you know, kind of a skater. This is actually happened the deepest, the coldest part of the last 10,000 years. It's at a time period called Little Ice Age, Small Ice Age. Big Ice Age is the one that in Boston we are three miles thick, 21,000 years ago. But the Small Ice Age happened around this time, okay? And of course, here I simply want to say that the sun activity don't only come in sunspot, you gotta measure so many other things, okay? Technical details are for the NASA people. You measure calcium K and that kind of thing. But here's a sample. You basically showing you that how when the sun rotate, sun rotate by itself in 27 days, one rotation. And then you can see that this is a major light output, that's the magnetic field, and then that one measures UV and all the way to X-ray. You have all this sun, and then all of that, they, all of a sudden they say the sun couldn't do anything, right? Which is very puzzling. And now I want to come to straight to the problem. This is what I call a chart that actually captures everything. I only show you some, uh, this is about 12 or, 15, there are more than 20 experiments, okay? That all the different satellite measurements. Think about this. What does it tell you? Not much. <laughs> Everywhere. Look at how much each of the project is. 200 million minimum. How much money are already spent on this? This is basically people want to do the same thing over and over, they want to change the size, and everybody wants to say the sun couldn't change, and then give us more money to measure things like this. I, I am a solar physicist, by the way. So I call this an embarrassment of solar physics. Because when you bought, this is partly related to this obsession with CO2. I have to tell you deeply if you look into it. So I would say that NASA plan to not launch chimpanzee into the sun during midnight, right? <coughs> it's terrible. <laughs> there is consequence, how you put them all together, okay? <laughs> One of the consequences is that you can actually get results like this. Right, you can have a curve like this. This is actually the curve that recommended by IPCC. The six assessment. They say that use this. And then we say that there's a possibility that you can get graph like this. We call it acrim calibrator. This all depends on the type of satellites and what accuracy you have. So there's a lot of technical detail, but the bottom line is that you have a variety of choices. You cannot say that, oh, please use only this one. Okay? That's what IPCC said. So let me show you quickly. So in the paper that we just published in October, we compiled that not one, 27 different TSI, the estimate of the sunlight output, okay? And then, never mind the details, we have a lot of that. But in the, in the fourth assessment, you know, in the fourth assessment in 2007, IPCC actually recommended not one, six. And then when they come to 25, uh, 2013, in fifth assessment, they actually say four, which is four of this that we plotted here. And then look at the sixth one, they say only one. Okay, think about it. How did they get more and more confident when the data get goes go the opposite direction? That tells you it's not science, it's politics. So the eighth one that we want to consider is this one. We think that it's very, very good. So in the paper that we just published in September or August, look at what we did. We got 37 co authors 18 countries, 188 references, right? This is serious work, actually. All these scientists, they just don't simply sign on, they just agree, we work together trying to find out the best way to present and show the results. So here's an example. Comparing the IPCC recommended irradiance and then their temperature curve, which is the, the one that have urban heat island, and look at the one that we use only rural and then our recommended uh, uh, irradiance. They fit, okay? We can even explain a lot of this, you know, detail. Those are all technical details we will explain to you. But that's what I'm trying to show you. Now I want to almost finish, by the way. Please be patient. I spent all my time, take a few days off to come all the way, give me the few minutes to finish. Yeah. October, a paper just came out again. We wrote this paper, we are very proud of this, by the way. This is a powerful work, really good work. So instead of talking one or two irradiance or one or two temperature record, we study all, all five of them, five temperature record and 27 TSI. And we want to show you an example here. This is the same one as rural. If you fit only this rural station by using the, the anthropogenic crossing, you can see it doesn't capture the up and down, right? Well, when you use any of the solar, you don't need only the, the one, the specific one that we recommend. You can use any of them. We can show it can fit rather well. And then if you don't believe me, 
Look at the sea surface temperature. Remember, sea surface temperature is separate from the land surface thermometer. Different kind of measurement. Actually, more problem than two, but we collect the best data we can. Look at what we do. It is explained by CO2. There's no chance. You can only explain the last part. You don't explain the first part. That's not an explanation. It is like getting a 30% in my grade and I try to say, oh, I'm so good, I'm so good. No, you have to explain everything. So we got all of it in some sense. And then if you talk about the tree rings, we are also doing quite well. And it doesn't matter what TSI we use, more or less they are very powerful explanation. It show you that something is conclusive and, and very interesting. So let me make two conclusions, two slides. The first point is that if IPCC or EPA or NOAA or NASA insist that urbanization bias is small, they actually try to put a number. This is how they want to make it very sciencey, convincing. It's 10%, they say less than, oh, it's, we don't have to look at it. It's been studied to death. It's 10%. We show no, 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 no. It's much more than that. The problem is big. It's 40 or even a whole big gorilla in the room. And then if they talk about the irradiance, they have solved the best solar irradiance we use. Yeah, 100% wrong on that. It's not 99.9%, 100%. I'm convinced on that one. At least I have the authority. I studied the sun for 33 years. And then all these other problems, but I want to lead to the USGCRP. I think they likely have violated that, obviously. They have violated the Data Quality Act, e Act, and the Information Quality Act. Because the thermometer and the solar data they recommended and used from NOAA and NASA are really, really bad. It's, it is the same one, basically. They are the source of the information. So I want to say that they are really have violated this, this uh, Data Quality Act. And then all this anti-scientific and pseudoscience idea have been factored the US government rule, environmental rule makings. Decision making process that the US EPA and other agencies are not scientific, nor objective. And then most of the written law essentially are playing lip service, right? That uh, they're not transparent or permit any dissent or alternative scientific voices and opinion. And that's extremely unhealthy. So I don't think we should go there. Probably again, I'm over my time. I'm done now. Please ask a question. Thank you. We're going to keep the recording going, right? Sure. Okay. Any question at all, please, Greg? Uh, well, you mentioned uh, TSI uh, measurements, various measurements in the, in the modern era based on satellites. You have TSI proxies that go back, say, a, a couple of centuries, and how good are they? You know, for instance, the climate models, the, the big trick is, is to uh, retrofit the data with uh, aerosols and all everything. So they say, hey, the climate models really do a good job in the past. But I was wondering if they're good proxies for TSI in the, in the past, can you explain some of the variability that uh, they have to correct for in the climate models using aerosols and others? Yeah, that is a very technical issue. And uh, the, the TSI proxy, unfortunately, people rely on uh, two things. One is basically measuring the radioactive carbon-14, because carbon-14 is essentially made by something related to the sun. So you have some information there. All beryllium 10 that fall into ice core. Carbon-14 assimilated into the celluloids of the tree, right? Tree ring. So you measure that, you can tell some information. And then carbon, beryllium 10 is just basically break a part of, of the nitrogen and all that form beryllium and then form in the stratosphere and then they're precipitated into the ice core. You measure the concentrator, you can give some information on how the sun varies. And the best information indeed go back 2,000 years, is even longer. Okay. But the problem is that we don't know how to connect that to irradiance. It gives you something called solar activity, but it doesn't give you the information on irradiance. That's a kind of technical problem. Yeah. Yes, please. Sir. Do you see this as a, a problem that because kind of the ideas that come from climate change are so kind of entrenched politically, yes. people are just unwilling to see that there's flaws in the data? It's true, yes. Yeah, but I, I hope you don't be scared to tell them, no? No, I know. You know what I mean? You want to bring a flag? Come on. Just kidding. <laughs> just show them the data. Don't worry, show me data. Like, never mind. Don't get mad. Just show the data, that's all. And if they have data to show you, let them show the data. But I can tell you, it won't go nowhere. The data is just what I show you. That's all it is. That's the state of the art, the best of the best. And again, they're talking nonsense, okay? It's a bit embarrassing. Yes? 
Have you got this information to any politicians? It seems to me they're the ones, or I don't know who's going to go after these agencies, if not politicians. Like, how do you I how don't do you know. These I can guys? start talking to them. That part is not my territory. I will do my best, of course, because if anybody needs science expertise to speak on that, or even have a science debate, by all means, invite the best guy over here. I'm fine. I always do that. By the way, I do so many times. It's not, I'm not trying to say anything. We should be civil and discuss this thing. But... Most of them don't want to show up, okay? They don't want to show up. <coughs> or, or they will start with this. Oh, you will it soon. Oh, you just take money from the government. What kind of yeah. argument is that? That's not even signed. Let's, uh, I'm talking about data. Can we talk about data? Please, please wait later. We'll talk about money. I'll show you how much cash I got. But not <laughs> now. Let's talk about science. They never want to talk about science. They're always about Willison, Corruptors, and this and that. That I'm not a Harvard person. They used to say that I hang out near the, the corridor of the scientist. <laughs> Shoot, man, I got office there, you know? I, I went there as the postdoc and they select only three people out of 175. I guess one of the lucky guys, you know? I am lucky, I'm blessed. But I want to study science. I'm not, I'm not into the science to be famous, to be rich, or to be, you know what I mean? Although I kind of look a little bit better today, right? But anyway, not for honor, not for fame, fortune, or anything. For the pure pursuit of uh, truth, nothing but the truth, right? Yes. And Dr. So, you, one of your pitch is very interesting, but uh -huh. related to the uh, statistics uh, that suggest Dallas, Houston, Austin, in Texas being the oh, most yeah. populated city. And uh, I mean, for an amateur in your field of study, such as myself, uh, um, can you help me understand a little bit and maybe just a couple points on how is the data quality, record quality of those agents that really kind of, I guess, uh, in your view, you know, misinformed. Uh, well, to support that statement, but not for another 70 years. So if you can help me understand. Well, this that. one is just... Uh Newspaper, I, I would have to claim that I'm uh, innocent on this because I didn't go and check this particular data. I mean, it's a projection, right? It's, uh, I think uh, just basically using population projection and economy, right? Texas, it will be very promising. It shows you how promising Texas is probably because of your, your kind of a, not so much of a government control business that you have a lot more freedom, right? If you measure the freedom index, I mean, clearly that would tie to, you know, how you manage your, your system. But anyway, the, 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 is, the, the problem here is very simple in my view. They say that globe is warming, but they're using a data that is contaminated. That's basically for the mind. Because they claim that the urban heat island effect can be neglected. And then this is why this problem has been hidden for so long. And then we have a lot of technical like paper. That's why at least 10 of them. There are a lot of each of them step by step tackle a lot of the problem that was uh, saying that it's all been done, so don't look at it anymore, done, deal, finish, all done. And then we keep pointing out that, look, you haven't solved this and that. You didn't solve A, you didn't solve B, you didn't solve D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, L, P. All of them. So many problems. And then all we do is that, you know, all this work. By the way, am I trying to do any of this? Zero. I used to have funding from NASA, I used to have funding from Air Force, I used to have all of that funding, by the way. The, the most unfortunate part about this is that they didn't know that I'm the guy who cared about science. You know, I have to apologize to my wife, I have to take care of my kid, they have to eat, you know, dude. But the problem is that I don't care about it either. We have a little bit of amount of food, we can eat, that's fine. But the problem is that all the funding for my funding of those government things got cut. No more. And then I have to get funding asking for Exxon Mobil Foundation. Yes, I, I wrote to them. Here's a proposal for this amount of work for fifty, sixty thousand dollars for one year. And here's what I will do, right? I'll reset the topic and write papers. Is that reasonable? I, I didn't say that I'm going to make the conclusion that only you like. I tell, I tell everybody who wants to fund me, please don't tell me what to say. <laughs> if you want to tell me what to say, I wouldn't even take money from Great Pits. And so you don't tell me what to say. That's it. Money is money, just do research. You know, things like that. I hope you understand. So the quality of the data is so important. You cannot keep saying that, you know, oh, global warming is a solved problem. We have proof to show that. Where is the proof? I should just show you there's no proof. 
Why they are looking at is something that's not related to rising atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's related to changing the surface of the land use. You know, like even the land surface is changing. You know, more trees, less trees, and who knows what, street running through, like in, in big city, like, like Seoul, Korea, one of the major way to cool this thing is to run water stream, and actually more vegetation is kind of cool down the system. I mean, <laughs> and then, on, by the way, there's one fact that I, although it's not a topic, it's very, I hope it's obvious to you, and you guys have heard anything about global warming is this. I have looked for the bad effects of CO2 for a long time for 32 years, as honest as, as, as I can. I cannot find one that is bad. You know, the claim that CO2 causing hurricane, where is Neil Frank, which is a former director? He can speak to that. There's no way that this CO2 can change the hurricane intensity or the, or the size of the hurricane or, or you know, how fast it moves on. It's nonsense. This hurricane is a phenomenon, it's something going on, but much more complicated kind of thing. And then, I, I look at all of this. The only thing you find that is true about CO2 is this. God, please take home with that. You know what? It makes the planet greener. That one is measured by NASA. Thank you, NASA, for making that measurement. At least how taxpayer money is being put into good use, right? It makes the planet greener. Or even more desert area turning green. You all know, right? Because more CO2 means better water use efficiency by all plant species, especially, you know, goods. C3, plant PC, that you yeah, actually, the somata size, you know, you all live, always have the big top behold for, for making water going in and out. When you have more of these, the things start closer, so you lose less water. The, the, the plant managed, water management is much more efficient, so you have actually more greener planet. Even desert area turn green. I mean, maybe you don't like desert area turn green, but that is not my problem. All yeah. I'm trying to tell you is that the planet that's got greener, okay. Positive or negative is your point of view, but you know what? You cannot just keep saying, like I say, CO2 is the gas of life. You cannot turn it into something called satanic gas, right? It's a very, very crazy thing for them to say this kind of thing. So please tell more people about this. I mean, I always say, including those guys who don't like me, I take all the data, I mean, discuss, oh, if anything I say is wrong, yeah, come on, man, let's talk about it, right? Because the policy and the energy stuff, the consequences are too large. It's too large. I mean, I mean, I think that people like us in America were fine. You want to talk about how about the two million people in Africa who got no access to electricity, no clean water, no electricity? You want to talk about that? How about that? I mean, things like this, you know, it's very serious, and we should not be taking this thing for granted. Okay, jo Josiah, maybe you ask a question. Do we have to um, do it's one quick question? Into the classroom. Yeah. Okay. Come. Okay. Quick thing. You mentioned something about getting politicians engaged, and I imagine that's a third rail for most politicians. So, Willie, do you know besides Senator Hinhoff, any federal level politician, Congress representative, House representatives, or senators, besides Hinhoff, that steps forward and says the King has no clothes? You know. You know what I have. You know what happened. I just happened to wrote a book chapter for the Heritage Foundation, which is one of these conservative group, right? They, are, they finally want to jump into this uh, climate change issue. Thank God. At least they realize how important. So they, they form a climate science advisory group. I'm one of the lucky guys to be on it. Even though I don't know more big affiliation, I don't really care. You don't want me? Fine, I'm out. <laughs> I don't get paid for nothing. You know? I wrote a book chapter. My goal was basically Senator Ted Cruz would read it. That's my goal. We try to use no technical language. I cannot use the word homo. I don't want to scare people with the word homogenization, all kinds of things. I apologize. But the problem is that a lot of these things are really a bit technical. But don't be afraid, right? Come on, after all, it's a bit simple, isn't it? I mean, it's just something like that. I, I, I hope there are more. There are some Congress people that I think would be more courageous, probably. I don't know, but I. You guys, please figure that one out, right? And then if anybody need help with data or anything, please remember, it's only me. You have Neil Frank, former director. You have George Stagmeyer, this guy, National Academy of Engineering. They are all Professor Larry Bell. These are all big time guns. I'm just a little kid that just do stuff and, uh, and things like this, you know, maybe looking for free food, <laughs> things like that. But that's what I do. I love science too much. You don't have to thank me for nothing. I don't care, I do this, I'm very happy. Actually, I'm a lot more happy right now because I finally solved some interesting problem. I mean, there's one more problem that I solved. I, I shouldn't say that, but it's enough. I solved one problem that's very, very important. You know what? People in meteorology and climate science look down 
100 years later, 100% the name Williston cannot be erased. Because you know why? I solved some really interesting problem. Anyway, that's fine. Not, not to show off, but I really did something good. Let me make one comment. The reason why Heritage is finally on the right page, because we shipped Kevin Roberts from Texas Public Policy to oh, D.C. Okay, it's your you Texas finally guy. got the message because the Permian Basin in Texas, God, well, Texas is key to the survival of this country. Yeah. So they get it. We have a few that want to spread that word. Yeah. But the Permian Basin is kind of lost mm -hmm. in the effort. But mm -hmm. the whole idea is people in Austin, a few of the people get it. Yeah. Not everybody in Austin, yeah. but a few. Right. I mean, I, I met Dick Bikin myself. I mean, the guy, the guy, I don't know why he gave all his wind blade. He, he was betting big on that one, right? The Texas wind. And just disrupting the grid, causing even more problem, actually. So, yes, thank you. We're done. Thank you.